Great. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Shirsten Bohm, and I work with IREX. Um, IREX is a nonprofit based here in DC, doing lots of really great work in this area of education and youth. We also work in capacity building for civil society organizations and independent media. Um, and in my free time, I uh, co-chair the Society for International Development Youth in Development Working Group. Um, and Thank you, Kristen. Uh, good morning. My name is Hannah Flores. I work for FHI 360. Uh, we do, uh, it's a nonprofit, and we do education and uh, many other things, especially health. Um, and again, as you were saying, in my free time, I am the co chair of the education work group. Um, so we're very happy to have you all here today. And so, Anna and I have been working with the panelists. Um, to put together this morning's um, panel on the role of education in technology um, that we hope will, you'll find really interesting. I was um, thinking how relevant this topic is to the various conversations we've heard earlier this morning and um, thinking about how Administrator Shaw said, you know, if you can find the time and the resources to have a couple of people at your organization that are really pushing the envelope and thinking about how to push boundaries on how we use technology in the field of development, tr try to devote those resources and try to find that time. Um, IREX has, is lucky enough to have um, recently created a center for collaborative technology, which allows us to do just that, to have a couple of people at IREX that are devoted to thinking about how we use technology across all of our programs. Um, and you'll hear a little bit more about that in the panel. Anna and I just wanted to tell you a little bit about the working groups at SID. Um, there's 22 working groups, and they are focused on a variety of things. Topics like ours, like youth and development or education, geography, so parts of the world, um, and other sort of cross-cutting themes as well. They're totally open to anyone in the development community. Um, and all you need to do is sign up for the mailing list and you'll get information. They're mainly, our main role is to sponsor events in the community that allow us to share best practices and lessons and network and learn from each other. Um, so if you're interested more in either of the working groups that Anna or I co-chair, youth or education, you can see us afterwards. We'll get you on our mailing list. And you can also sign up for those um, on the SID website. And they're a great way to just kind of shape the agenda for what SID is doing and be involved in the annual conference and just the conversations that we're having. Do you want to say anything more about that? Um, just uh, um, if you are interested in leading panels and not just to participate in panels, this is a great opportunity for you to bring your ideas and that we can kind of like take it together. And it's not just kind of like a one direction, but it's uh, two directions. So you're more than invited to um, join us in that effort. Great. Um, so I am going to turn things over now to Steve Anzalone. You'll notice in your programs that Steve is not Mike Trucano from the World Bank, who is, who is listed in your programs. Mike had a um, last minute schedule change, and Steve was great enough to step up for this role um, just a few days ago. Um, Steve is a vice president at EDC. He's responsible for um, their ICT and their development division, and also the Asia and Middle East programs in those regions. Um, and he's been involved in and really a leader in the field of ICT and education since the early 80s, um, which is way longer than my career. <laughs> and um, we're really thrilled to have him here with us today. Um, and so I'll turn it over to Steve and the panel. Great. Great. Thank you. Is this on? I guess it is. Thank you. Thank you, Sherston and Anna. Um, <clears throat> welcome, everyone. Uh, nice to have you here with us. Um, our charge today is to take a look at, as our starting point, um, Sid has brought us together and wants to take a look at the sustainable development goals that, will, that we hope will be framed and will kick in and, and guide us from 2015 onward. And, very foremost among those two goal, uh, are two goals. Um, one is scale, but the other is to really trying to get at um, uh, shrinking, and if not eliminating, um, 
again, the absolute poverty on that. Um, and as we looked at that, I think there are very few people today are going to argue that anymore that education isn't going to have, doesn't, wouldn't play a key role in, in, in that quest. Um, 20, 30 years ago, um, you, you, would have to, you, you would have to engage in that argument with many development planners, but not, but not today. Uh, what we have to talk about today, though, is that, okay, well, how would the um, tools and systems and products of uh, technology help education in that quest? in the quest now to be able to go in and, and remove absolute poverty, but accomplish a lot of other good things for other populations at the same time. It's not mutually exclusive. And so I just ask you, first of all, to think, um, think of this again in terms of uh, if we set this as an international community as a goal, uh, will we take it seriously as a goal? We were, will we really go after trying to, um, as, tech, as those of us who see ourselves having worked in the area of technology, we try to fashion things that will solve problems. And if this is the goal we're going to have, then can we adjust our systems and stuff that we like to do uh, to really go after this goal and not just uh, roll it out and hoping that it collides in some uh, beneficial way with that, um, that part of the world. Uh, so that's what I would like you to be able to, if you would reflect on a little bit as we get into this. And let me just also say, and as a housekeeping thing, again, education, we're to talk about um, technology and education here, um, for our purposes, uh, we're going to take education as being writ large. Um, yes, it's about the teaching learning processes that go on, and, but it's also about the information and systems that support the learning environments, it's how they're organized and managed, and how we actually connect learners and that to the wider world of um, uh, of information and, and, and things that are out there in the larger community. It's not just about what goes on in schools and daycare centers and that, but it's also in, in the things that we're going to be do, do with young people and adults as we prepare them for employment and indeed, you know, um, all the other important parts of, parts of their life. Um, yes, that is a huge, a wide terrain on that. and. Um, uh, we probably won't do justice to it all, but we have assembled a panel here that I think um, was rather d deliberately chosen and I think covers, uh, if not all the bases, some very important ones. And let me just quickly introduce them to you. Um, you can have full bios and I won't read those out uh, aloud. I'll start with, with uh, Nicole Golden, who is an economist and an educator, director of the youth Prosperity and Security Initiative at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Um, Nicole brings uh, an unusually strong experience, um, I think, working with youth. And she's worked both inside and outside of government and um, has worked both at the policy and the activity level. Um, next to me, um, Alex Pompe is with IREX, the Center for uh, Collaborative Technology. Um, we've asked Alex to join us, um, again, particularly not just for his understanding of technology, but technology as it presents itself in the shop floor. Um, unlike many, we'll see, Alex has actually been a teacher. Um, and um, has worked as a teacher in the Ukraine and in Namibia and this works also on issues of public access to information and libraries. Again, another important piece of the, the educational landscape. Um, he's designed a science ed app for an iPhone, so I think that gives him real bona fides as a techie. And um, welcome, Al Alex. And on my left here, um, Kurt Moses, Director of Policy and Information Systems for the Global Learning Group at FHI 360. 
Uh, Kurt and I have been having these discussions for at least 30 years now. But I'm uh, only 27. Yeah. <laughs> okay. so, uh, well, uh, technology yes. has an answer for that, too, see? Um, and um, I don't think I'm overstating the case in saying that. And we look at technology in developing countries. Kurt has pretty much worked everywhere. And he's worked across um, all known platforms and applications that I can think of um, and uh, I think understands education pretty much in its breadth and, and the possibilities for technology there. So this is our group. Um, our first uh, half an hour, I'm going to, we'll ask them a couple of questions on that. Again, we're trying to think about our goals for 2015 and, and, and beyond. Um, so this is meant to kind of help panel. I hope we'll take a little bit of assessment of, of what's gone right, of what we've managed to accomplish in the last um, uh, couple of decades on that. And, and um, in that process then I think will lead us to saying, well, what, you know, where have we made mistakes and what do we have to, what really do we have to learn next and then do next as we look for 2015 and beyond. Um, so I will, um, I'm going to ask, uh, we'll go through the panel, ask them each of those two questions and then we're going to throw the floor open. This is meant to be a debate, folks, and it's, um, um, you know, I would hope we don't all just manage to bore ourselves into some kind of a hibernation until um, lunchtime. So uh, feel free uh, uh, to um, process, comment, and take exception on when you get there. Um, again, Nicole, let me start with you. Um, you've, um, again, seen a lot of what um, uh, has been going on in developing countries in these first efforts to try to harness technology into uh, making the kinds of programs that we have, and particularly youth that you've seen, and that, which has grown in, by leaps and bounds in importance. What, what has been the achievement that you think is probably the signature, a signature achievement or, or something we can take from this that we should, that we should think about in terms of success? Sure, thank you, and uh, thanks Steve, thanks uh, Shearson and Anna for uh, putting this together, and thanks to you all for being here. Um, I'm gonna answer first with a quick caveat that I'm actually am not a technologist, and so I think um, I'm going to um, be a very avid um, listener as well to my colleagues on the panel that will hopefully speak from that more micro um, and technologist and really you know educationalist um, perspective as well. I think for me, um, being a broader, um, being bro more broadly in the space of youth development, youth well-being, um, as many of you know, we recently uh, released a global youth well-being index that was really looking at these more macro level kind of status indicators of how young people are doing around the world. And I think in that context, um, what, what really excites me, um, and I know we're going to get to um, what our concerns are, if you will, or what our concerns are on the uh, false start side of this uh, conversation. Now, is the, the, very, the rapid pace of pickup and the opening of opportunity, and I know we're gonna get to what, you know, some of the downsides and the lingering divides um, as well, um, but, you know, we know, you know roughly half the world's internet users now, for example, are young people um, who, Everyone in this room, I'm sure, knows it make up half the world's population at large. So, when I often, you know, think about, um, you know, technology is really how it's become that central nervous system to young people. Um, and um, I'm glad you brought up, you know, a very broad way to think about education. Um, obviously, it's expanding um, learning opportunities, and we'll hear more about that. Um, the way, not just on the the access, but you know, one of the things that I'm really excited about um, in the more education space specifically is how technology um, is changing delivery and, and the way that different types of educational technologies, whether it's edutainment and gaming, um, is making young people um, be more excited to learn, I think, than before. And a lot of the young people that I talked to that have had the opportunity to engage with technology 
um, talk about that. And I think that increases um, what they're learning, how they're learning, the willingness to learn, the learning outcomes that we're starting to see. Um, so I think that's just um, one example of something that I'm excited about. I think for me it's hard to pinpoint um, a very you know, specific overall great achievement. I just think for, for young people, just the way that we're seeing technology come, um, come into their lives. Um, and because they're such adopters, I'd say the one other thing I'll mention, and then I'll love to hear from my colleagues, is um, you know, we, all, we often talk about the role that young people play in their families and in their communities as really kind of generational leaders, as generational change makers. You know, the future not only sort of hinges on young people today and for tomorrow, but I think with technology, that's really, that, that's really true, that really comes to life. And you often, I mean, look, like my niece, who is, 10 schools me on you know the app that I need to get on my iPad. Um, and so I think in, in increasingly we see that around the world and the role that young people are playing in bringing technology and what it offers not only to themselves but to their families I think is kind of uh, just brings out that, that generational catalyst um, aspect that we think about in terms of youth empowerment and youth well-being. So I'm going to stop there and um, add more later. Okay, thank you thank for you. The, the metaphor of the, <laughs> of the central nervous system. Um, I like that, Nicole. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll, I, don't I hope you don't mind if I steal that and borrow it from, from time to time, but it, it, it fills a need there. Um, okay, um, Alex, let me put the same, same question to you. Um, from, 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 from your vantage point, you do a lot of traveling in the countries now and you see how these, um, how our stuff is getting used and, and, and what it's producing. What, would you, what do you think we've got to build on in terms of accomplishments? Sure, thanks Steve and thanks to Sid for letting me be part of this distinguished panel and thanks to the audience for, for turning out and contributing to the discussion. Um, to key in on a, a really important success, I, I don't know if it's, possible to name a greatest success, but one that really excites me when I look at education and technology um, in the field work that I've been working on, is that um, when we see technology, if we put aside um, barriers to access and we say we see computers, technology, mobile phones in schools, and then we see what happens with those, is that very often this, these devices or these uh, projects can often overturn pre-existing social hierarchies. And so in Namibia, when we're putting, we see the government um, make a great effort to put uh, computers into schools, it's the, the youth in those schools who learn the, the skills to repair and maintain those computers in many cases, especially when they're given uh, more direct access to it. And this becomes a very, um, the teachers will turn to the student. To, to learn how to use the device. Um, and so there's some ex examples that I can point to of where um, an agriculture teacher in a rural region of the country um, wanted to make a textbook that wasn't from South Africa. And so he had a, a team of 10 youth who knew how to use the computers in the computer lab um, better than, or more efficiently than he did to help him create that uh, example of local knowledge that then becomes an instructional tool in a more classical sense. And so we see this, um, these power dynamics have shifted. These youth that perhaps in a traditional education format it would be very rote lecture focused and the power would sit at the front of the room, but in this uh, technology enabled environment the youth are able to, to find more social capital. Um, likewise, um, in Ukraine, when we put computers in libraries and train librarians on how to make this uh, accessible to the community, they often find that the youth are, again, bringing their grandparents into the library to learn how to make Skype calls to their relatives who are working in Western Europe or who may be protesting in the Euromaidan protests. So um, this is another area where uh, uh, someone who traditionally maybe it doesn't have that expertise or doesn't have expertise that's so useful to an elder um, can realign those power structures. Um, and then finally, when, if we take an example from the mobile phone world, um, rural farmers in Bhutan who perhaps are illiterate um, but do own a device, and the only reason they would use this is because they have their children who can read the text messages to them. So again, we see new ways in which um, traditional norms maybe are overturned and the 
I think the, the final application of this is when we can see innovation and expertise from the Global South educate us here uh, in the Global North. So it's not just someone in Silicon Valley developing a technology tool and hoping that it does good work um, in the developing world, but that we learn from innovation we see in areas like mobile banking, things that really grew up from a grassroots developer community in rural Africa. Um, and this is really the most exciting extension of that same paradigm shift, is where innovation, capacity for repair, I personally would trust someone in sub-Saharan Africa to repair my cell phone before I trust someone down the street here in Washington, D.C., because they fix phones all the time. And this sort of re-education and realignment is very exciting to me. Great. Thank you. <clears throat> Kurt, I'm going to pu put the same question to you, but with a twist. Um, and if you, and if you have time, if you have time to get at it, I'm going back to um, a quote you probably don't even remember from a gathering long, uh, long ago. Um, Kurt once paraphrased some of the words Peter Drucker and reminded us that um, success uh, involves some, usually two things. One, doing the right thing, but also doing the right thing right. And if you can have time in your remark, Kurt, just could you give us uh, your thoughts on, in terms of what we're doing, the communities, um, are we doing the right thing now and are we doing it right? <laughs> well, thank you, actually, that's a great opening. Um, yeah, Peter Drucker had said that and he was referring to most organized enterprises, wherever they were in the world. And some of you may remember him as a person who also said, so what business are you in? So that's the question you really have to answer before you can actually organize yourself to do anything. The classical version of that was that form should follow function. First figure out what it is you're supposed to be doing and then find the right way to do it. Um, let me go back to your original question. I'll mm -hmm. try to loop around. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, the thing that I think has actually changed, at least in my lifetime, is the concept of self-empowered communication. That's not a technology, it's a way of life. Um, and, and by the way, I'm reminded, automobiles used to be a technology. They used to be. They were brand new and they were called horseless carriages, etc. And now they're just a fact of life. They're part of our environment. Um, go a little ways back, telephones were a technology at one point and now they're just something you expect when you walk in to any other place. Uh, they're no longer wired and they're no longer stuck on walls, but they were a technology. Um, the, the way I'd like to approach that fundamental question, what's the big change, is really in three parts. For a quote technology, which usually for a while means new, it, it's got to have three parts to make it happen. You've got to have people, the audience or the users or whatever, who want to be empowered. You've got to have processes in the environment whether it be political or social or otherwise, to make that possible. And by the way, that process issue is also highly related to costs, which uh, as we talk, I'll get back to. And then the third part is a technology. Um, most people in the world, there's maybe 5% who really like stuff that's complex. But I would submit the majority of people, if it's not essential to their way of life, don't like complex things. And if you're looking for an example of a real revolution in terms of self-empowered communication, it was Stephen Jobs. Now, in a dictatorial manner, he created something that involved a push of one button. And I think that has transformed how we even think about what technology should do for us. Uh, by the way, I think it's a real wake-up call for educators. Because if you think about it, most of us have a pretty good education. We're here, we're interested, we're, most of us are passionate. Um, that came through a very traditional system, and that system actually rewarded complexity because you got promoted based on the questions you could ask, all the things that weren't answered. But if you talk to some of your young children, they, they kind of don't want all that complexity. <laughs> They're waiting till it'll lead to something that'll empower them. So let me go to the next part of this. I, I would include that the technologies we ought to be focusing on include in some cases, particularly for post-conflict countries, radios, which I mentioned to Nicole. Some people are very attuned to radios. And by the way, when we tried this out, we were doing soap operas on TV. What's the problem with that? You cannot sew, tend your children, etc., 
very easily with TV, but you can with radio because you can listen and do other things. The other part of this is that I just got out of Sierra Leone and Liberia and South Sudan. I'm looking at how these economies are going right now. 16%, mostly the youth, are now involved in some fashion as an enterprise related to cell phones. 8% are fixing them. 8% are charging them. Now, there's a technology that's going to become ubiquitous. And why is that? Because the cell phone is creating empowerment. People want to communicate. So it seems to me that the real theme, what, what the 20th and 21st century are going to be noted as, are the centuries of communication. And so our view of technology, and I, I can show you sort of what the process is, that our view of technology has got to be shaped by that, is about the things that create communication. The internet is okay in some places, but where it costs too much, it's near useless except for the elite. And that reinforces the power structure. I liked very much what Alex said about overturning hierarchies. When you create new communication paths, you tend to create a bypass strategy. If you have an ossified bureaucratic environment, this is the way the youth go around that. And one last comment. I knew things had really changed when the former president of the Philippines that I knew was overthrown because of SMS text messages. When a communication medium allows you to overthrow a sitting president and coordinate the political responses that closely, you know you've got something. And what was that about? That was about communication. So I'll leave Great. it there for now. Okay. Um, I, these are big changes, and I you know, ask you, to, you know, to really to consider them um, um, of the the transformation that has gone on in, in the places that we work. Um, I would, when we get into now as we're going forward and trying to look at things that uh, maybe we need to focus more on, the difficulties that we've had, let me start with the one with my concern. My concern is that when I started, my, my first little effort was in Africa in the early 80s and we were working with children and um, on computers and electronic learning aids. Um, the vision on that part that totally um, blew me, would have blown me away today is just is what we, the accessibility that we're talking about now. Um, I can go to a conference and hear someone saying, you know, um, more people have access to uh, technology and communications technology than have access to toilets. Um, I'm not sure that is a really a good thing, but I would, who would have, would have dreamed in the 80s that it would ever have gotten to that point. Um, the part that also of, that, of an 80s vision of that was that the power of this technology was really going to transform the education process itself. This was going to mean people are going to learn more, faster, more difficult things reach higher, and more and more would reach higher standards of, of, of learning on that. If we look at the kind of reviews of the literature when they come out, InfoDev had a few years ago, again, a, a review of the outcomes on that, and they found that none of that has really happened. Um, the educational ben benefits, pretty much, you know, not the, uh, in terms of, of the learning that goes on in, in classrooms and that haven't been realized. I suspect that's probably true today. Um, so for me, that has been my disappointment. I would have loved to have seen, um, you know, third graders now, I don't know, doing differential equations or, you know, I don't know, some, you know something more real. But that's, um, oh but at the, at the same time, um, has this, um, has our educational vision, was it just that it was too, too, more too limited? That in fact, as it went to become our central nervous system and the, the broader social transformation effect meant that we were putting the wrong indicators out there for success. So I don't know. Um, I'm unwilling to give up at this point that uh, this technology really can't help us on some of the 
traditional outcomes of the teaching learning process. I haven't given that up, but um, as we look toward our new sets of goals on that, I think we should take this, into, uh, take this into account. And let me ask the panelists, and then we will go to you, on where, what you think the challenges are that we think now for, um, okay, this is gonna be, you know, we're gonna have a new set of the millennium challenge type things. Okay, how do we frame those, and what do we, um, what do we set up both for success and, and, and things that we really want to, we really should be achieving if we're gonna, uh, if we're gonna reach the, uh, our goals of really getting at absolute poverty. Uh, Nicole, let's start with you. I get to go first again, wow. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, thanks um, for that great question. I mean, it's interesting um, when Working at the macro level, for example, with the index, we obviously think a lot about sort of indicators and, and looking at that macro level. So on the access point, I think we really saw um, the gaps that we have really come through. Um, we had a, a separate, we had six domains, if you will, in the index, six buckets, uh, sub-indices. Um, ICT was its own, um, as opposed to being built through. Um, the others, there were 40 indicators total, five of them um, within the ICT bucket. And what's interesting is um, the index, we, we covered 30 countries, high to low income, um, so many of them not what we would uh, consider developing um, at all, including the U.S., for example. Um, and one of the things that was interesting with regards to ICT in particular was that um, it had, the, the results in the ICT domain had the greatest um, range. So the top performer in, uh, on those five indicators was South Korea um, with a score, if you will, of 0.94. So uh, uh, from zero to one, 0.94. The highest actually score of any country in any of the domains. Um, the lowest was Uganda at 0.17. Um, and again, the distribution around the mean was huge. And I just bring that up as an example. One of the indicators that we included um, was from a recent study by the WTO, you might have seen it, that mapped for the first time digital natives, um, youth digital natives, which they defined as young people between the ages of 15 and 24 that had been online for at least five years. So again, this was the first time this study um, uh, was run, and what I'm optimistic about is that I think, it, you know, this is the kind of data point that if you run it annually, I think we'll see dramatic change. But in this first one, 9% of, uh, there was 9% digital natives in Africa and 79% in Europe. So just in, 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 you know, that access point, I think we, it really, we really need to give pause to how are we continuing to include radio? How are we continuing to include all forms of old media um, in terms of the information flow um, as well as the new media and making sure that we're leveraging the opportunity in new media, mm -hmm. um, you know, mobile and, and internet namely, but as well as I said, not sort of forgetting that most of the people that we are, young people in particular, that we are probably most concerned with may not necessarily have that access. So we want to bridge, we want to get that access, but we want to make sure that we're using other old media tools um, like radio, you know, that um, there's access to. On the, and so where does that feed into the MDG side? And I think that's a movement that I'm glad to see, um, you know, where education um, and technology are both coming into and where the power of technology to create platforms for voice, I think young people have really taken that up. If you've been following you know, the world we want, the, the different um, platforms um, for civil society um, and public participation in the process, young people have probably been the most active in that space. And it's interesting, I often end talks to youth, about youth, with youth, um, with one of my favorite quotes, which is, ask the, youth, ask the young, they know everything. It's uh, an 18th century French philosopher, um, Joseph Joubert. But in this case, um, there was a, a summit called Beyond 2015, and it was organized by the um, ITU last year, and it was trying to get what the youth want, um, specifically with regards to technology and education, what they see. And, you know, I'm just going to read this one quote from their declaration, which you can find online, and it's, it's, a, it's a good one. Um, but health, civic education, online protection, environmental protection, and economic success all depend on having unfettered access to knowledge, which ICTs can extend um, to the masses. So again, I'm realizing the potential, 
um, focusing on the fact that we still have a lot of digital divides, and again, looking at this in a, in a very um, broad way. Um, I'll sort of stop there. I can keep Thank going. Thank you. Okay. Pause. Well, Nicole, I'm going to take your advice, and let's ask the young. Uh, Alex, <laughs> could I um, um, put the question to you? Sure. So when we speak about challenges, we should be happy because there's no shortage of them moving forward, which means we'll be employed for a while. Um, but uh, a couple disclaimers. I think the, the challenge that I'm going to key in on, uh, for one, isn't isolated to just the education technology sphere. And second of all, I build technology for a living, and I'm about to disarm it massively, so you know this isn't a self-centered plug here because I might be talking myself out of a job. Um, I think the biggest challenge we have is to disarm the hype cycle around technology and development, and this is very analogous to how a technology product comes to market here in the US. New iPhone, boom, interest shoots up. Everyone's crazy about it, you wanna get it. Um, then this is similar to we put computers in a classroom, right? And that's what we're really excited about. It looks great. We get, you know, uh, government leaders next to development practitioners cutting ribbons, putting stickers on the side of a device. And pretty soon that comes crashing down into a reality that a year from now the computers aren't working that well, um, no one's there to fix them, or the person that knows how to fix them lives 12 hours away in the capital of the country. Um, and then it eventually, that's like the low point, right? Everyone's just, uh, this was classic development mistake. And then it kind of evens up and it reaches a little bit of an equilibrium. Like we, we have some sort of, we can do the computers, we can use the computers for some, you know, minor things, but it's really leveled off from that peak of the hype and the valley. This cycle is just completely counterproductive to the way we think about development. And so we need to stop focusing on the number of devices, the type of devices um, that are, exist. These are questions of access, and these are questions that um, mobile phones and the, the, the massive growth in that sector of mobile communications, they're solving for us. Um, so we need to stop thinking about putting the technology in for technology's sake. We need to think about technology, especially in the classroom, just like we think about classic education tools like textbooks, chalkboards, pencils, and pens. These are just tools. They're not learning outcomes and they're not successes for their own sake. Um, and we need to redefine then what we mean by success and how we think about those programs. So um, I think that's a main challenge is to disarm that hype cycle and understand the appropriate use of technology and that it's the tool and we can't let that tool define the solutions we're looking for on the ground. Great, thank you. Kurt. Thanks, Steve. Um, that's got an interesting twist. As Alex was talking, as I think about education and the one we're perhaps most familiar with, which is in a classroom, in terms of communication, looked at as a, st a structure within the classroom, you have three things going on. You have one-to-one -one communication, which ideally is the teacher and the pupil. And by the way, one-to-one -one is actually, it's a, it's a, it's a conversation. This is the classical Greek ideal. We're now in the age of massified education, mass education. So the question is, if that Greek education was so important, because all of us owe a lot to that and its concepts, how do we replicate that in the mass environment? So we, classroom came in as, as one of the ways of doing it. This is how you got one person with some knowledge and a bunch of kids who were presumably thirsting for knowledge. The ideal there was still to recreate the one-to-one -one relationship. The second part is one to many. Who's the many? These are the other members of the class, and in some cases, multiple teachers. And then you have the other side, which every politician knows about, and that's many to one. That's the broadcast media. The ideal situation for technology, and this goes back to Drucker doing the right thing, is to have all three modes of this communication going on at a reasonable cost for as many people as possible. So you can look at the barriers to each one of those relationships in multiple ways, and that's what you've really got to look at. As Nicole was saying, you, you want to know what youth want, but you also want to know is what youth should want, <laughs> and no society is going to be able to just allow what youth want, because there's a reason they're called youth. 
I'm sorry. I yeah. probably didn't think that when I was 21 because I knew everything. Yeah. But, but there's a reason they're called youth. So there is a balance of which education is the key example. It's a balance between what a society believes an educated citizen requires, or even a halfway decent citizen, maybe not even educated, and what, as it were, youth want. Our, our big issue, in my view, is we need to look quite analytically at the communications that we reproduced in traditional ways, probably very poorly, particularly in Africa. And then secondly, how that's going to happen in a cost-effective manner. And structurally, what are the barriers to each part of that? There's a political people barrier. There's a process barrier, which is legal, philosoph uh, not philosophical, but bureaucratic, and, and others. And then there's a technological barrier. What has really stunned everyone, in my view now, is the lowering of the price of technology. And that's been absolutely critical. All right? When cell phones in Uganda cost $1,000 a person and you had to have a contract, less than 3% of the population had cell phones. Now that they've dropped to $25 and in some cases $10, and somebody else put the infrastructure in and was willing to take that risk, it's now virtually ubiquitous. I've been to remote villages in Sierra Leone recently, and as you said, there's now more communication than there are toilets. There's, um, it, everybody wants that. <laughs> now the issue is the content and the barriers to the youth making effective use of this. And by the way, I would submit for us educators, one of the key things there are testing and certification, okay? Even if it's not just a matter of keeping the, the technology alive, because I think most youth, at least the ones I've met, could easily master what we need to know about keeping a device going. If number one, they're empowered to do it, okay, that's an issue because teachers are used to being the dominant figure. And then number two, if the society is willing to take alternate paths. And by the way, that's where the private sector has the advantage over the public sector. If you look at, mo I'm fairly familiar with colonial African structures, Kids, formal school systems were set up to supply bureaucrats. It was the demands of the government, what was required for a largely manual system, in some cases set up by the British, other cases by the French, in a few cases by the Italians. Education was set up with that, and you still see all the remnants of that. So you need, in my view, a private sector portion, just because they'll take people who can do things with good work habits and with intelligence and conviction and they don't actually care necessarily about all the formal qualifications. The issue is, can you deliver? And okay. so, I, I'm sorry, this is a bit more complex, but I think it is, because we're talking about empowerment. And empowerment always has at least two or three components. And again, it's, it's not the technology. We've got a private sector who's making lots of money off technology. And the issue now is, with most education, is you can't afford to do it yourself. You've got to take the leavings, hopefully the rich leavings, from what the private sector has spent money on. Okay, Nicole, do you want to add yeah, something to that? Yeah, I just want to follow before, up on before? that. Um, sorry, quickly, because um, you, you brought up an interesting point about uh, outcomes, and I think we've we've talked a fair amount um, so far about content and delivery, and I think there's one of the other opportunities again tying back to post 2015. Um, we found in our in our work and auditing all this data. No, no surprise here. Obviously, lots of data gaps in the developing world, particularly around outcomes. <laughs> Um, concrete outcomes in education, right? What are we measuring? And I think there is, in terms of some of the opportunities of technology, be interesting to talk a little about, you know, the role of technology in measuring, aggregating, sharing and disseminating data um, and sort of evidence around learning outcomes um, and, and gaps um, where those lie. And, and that gets into, I think, the inequality piece too, because one thing, you know, we, we talk about, we know, you know, uh, you know, in many situations, young women are not doing as well as young men or so on and so forth, and that, that's not the case everywhere, or where rural, rural youth are at a disadvantage to urban youth or so on and so forth. And I think there's an opportunity to leverage, you know, technologies, like I said, to better assess, better aggregate, um, and that will also then better help make the policy case, this is something, you know, Kurt and I were talking about before, better make the policy case on why we need more investment um, in these in these uh, in these systems. So, just a, a quick sidebar on that. Great. That's um, um, no, lovely. You Thank them. you. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to ask you. Um, okay. Um, I'd like to in this the next format. Oh, gee, I'm sorry with this. Uh, not even seeing well. The rest. 
I'll stay over here. Let's see if we can yeah, get this out of the way. That's your better profile. Right? Yeah, it is. Okay, yeah, I right. worked on that one in front of the mirror today. Okay, um, we're going to go into the, the, the Q&A uh, stuff here now. Uh, we'd like you to um, introduce yourselves, who you are, what organization you're with. Please be brief. Um, this is not this, this, this time for long-winded uh, organizational profiles here on that. Um, but, and um, again, you can make comments or questions on that. We'll take a couple at a time. Sometimes it's rather a one-to-one. -one. It's kind of hard to deal with. Let's take a couple at a time. And then I'm going to throw it to um, allow our panelists to decide which ones they, um, you know, they, they'd like to respond to. Um, in some cases, if they can't respond to them, we're going to just let them drop. I'm sorry, and we can maybe, <laughs> we'll take it up afterwards on that as best we can. Okay, who wants to, uh, who wants to go? This gentleman, yes. I, I would. I was looking to you for the answer to this one because this is what I've been. You know, I've been scratching my, you know, my head in it. But let's ask. Let's ask our panels what they think. Excuse me. Okay. Let's. Okay. We've got that question on it. Why haven't we? Okay. Could we? Could we also then, when we get the question, could we do them at the microphone then, please, on that? Okay. The question there on that is is. Um, okay. Why, the, um, why we haven't gone into um, uses of the, t of the technology that would be more, that would be behind better learning or something in areas like mathematics and science and that, why we haven't kind of followed that path more for enriched achievements? Is that a fair, fair question? Okay. Thank you. Uh, my name is Tarub Faramand. I'm the president of a, a, a small organization called Women Influencing Health Education and the Rule of Law. And we focus on gender integration in the three sectors. My question to you, how can we use the technology to address issues of learning gaps between boys and girls at a younger age? Uh, my, grand, my grandchild, I just came back from Florida yesterday, and he learned math and he learned how to read. He's only four, but he's trying to convince me that when he downloads uh, a game, that it's cheap, it's free. He can read free and he can compare the numbers. Uh, and he also tries to convince me that a, a candy bar has less sugar content, so I can get it for him. Just by looking online, it's crazy. So how can we reach those... Uh, young boys and girls in countries that we are struggling to keep girls in schools and also young boys in schools, and we can leverage the technology to address that gap. Thank you. Thank you. And let's take one more. Hello, my name is David Baxter. I'm with the Institute for Public Private Partnerships. We do a lot of capacity building in Africa with senior civil servants, and I call them the forgotten generation when it comes to technology because everyone's so focused on children and improving it in schools, but you have the 50-plus generation who have not learnt any technology, and so we give them platforms so that when they go back to the institutions, they have a new mechanism to disseminate and gather information. And I think the big gap that's occurring in many of the strategies is that we're not empowering the empowerers because if these folks don't have a sense that they need the technology to be applied in the institutions because they never touch it, they're not going to be champions and supported in any organization. Thank you. Okay. Alex, you want to start to respond to one or all of them? Sure. I'll start with the first one. So how do, how do we make sense of this world where someone knows how to use a cell phone, 
or a tablet when they're very young and then when they, grow, they drop out of high school because they don't uh, learn. I think part of this is understanding that technology is an amplifier. So an amplifier can take a, a positive signal and make it stronger, or it can take a negative signal and make it even more negative, okay? And these dynamics happen when you look at the ability for technology, in some cases, to suppress or make it easier to monitor populations, something we're coming to terms with here in our own country. Um, but this follows into the educational realm as well. And so if a youth uh, has access to a phone or a device or something like that, Perhaps it has the ability to increase the efficiency or abilities of their classical education sense, math, science, curriculums, and that. But it, you know what else it does? It makes it really easy to distract themselves. Mm -hmm. you, can, you amplify that communication ability for both positive and negative um, in terms of classic educational goals. So um, this is a revenge effect, and we need to come to terms with that. And that's understanding that the technology isn't an inherent social good or a great thing. It's understanding that this is an amplifier in either direction of the spectrum. Thank you. Nicole, yeah. Yeah, just to add to that, I mean, one thing, um, negative trend, if you will, on that kind of dark side is also when we think about tech and education, but cyberbullying um, and, um, and or m almost mobile bullying, um, you know, that's an increasing problem, not only in countries like the US, but elsewhere. And so again, something else uh, to be aware of. Um, on the, on the question about gender, again, I'll just go reiterate something I said before and defer um, to my colleagues with any more specific programmatic examples. So again, I think there is an opportunity to use technology to better um, understand um, and assess and really measure you know, outcomes, performance, and the state of sort of learning and, and where, where the investments need to be made and to help make that case um, for investment and policy change. Um, and your point about, on the last question, I'll comment on that, about um, mentoring um, and bring, empowering the empowerless and the sort of um, elder generation. Um, use my own example for Mother's Day this year, I gave my mother, um, uh, who I will not reveal her age, um, <laughs> but uh, um, um, my my old iPad 2 because I decided to get a new one and anyway so she's now like learning and trying to get her friends to help her learn how to use it um, but I think it, that also creates an opportunity again when we think about youth empowerment and youth leadership um, I've used this term before um, reverse mentoring um, this idea that we have a lot to learn from young people probably in some ways more than they um, can learn for us from us and I think there's a huge opportunity to leverage again this knowledge this adaptability this um, of young people um, as first users um, to train and, 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 and mentor and teach um, the generation above them, if you will, um, how, how to use it and how to engage. So I, a great question, I think a great, a great opportunity. I'm glad somebody asked about why children get it so quickly. Some of you may remember that MIT did some experiments with turtle theory. I don't know if you've read that recently. It comes straight out of Piaget and a chap I'm, I'm, I'm blanking on. Anyway, in 2000, he introduced one of the first Apple microcomputers in Senegal Papert. to a large... Seymour Papert. Seymour Papert, exactly. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Seymour Papert introduced one of the first Apple microcomputers into a Wolof-speaking uh, group in Dakar, Senegal. And what they did these were children between pretty much five and eight years old, is they used the Apple computer to move a turtle around the screen. The kids loved it. Mm -hmm. Why? Because when you're a little kid, to be able to actually control something as opposed to being controlled is a real high. And the, the other part, and this is the reverse of the revenge, he started two groups, one of older children and one of younger children. And he told the younger children they couldn't do what the older children were doing until they'd mastered certain things. But he put them in the same room at opposite ends of the, uh, of the classroom. And pretty soon the younger children were sending spies over to watch the older children. <laughs> and immediately took it back and they started doing what the older children were already doing. So they invented their own games and had enormously accelerated learning. Now that I know that there's now we have the uh, physiological principles behind all that, but here you had changed, transformed actually how the environment looked. 
And I would submit, even though I'm much older than those children, that, that they're inherent experimenters and they don't have preconceptions. And that's why they'll tell you outright you're fat. Uh, because they haven't been socialized. Or you're old. <laughs> or you're old. <laughs> or, why do you, or why do you look so unhappy? And I think this, I, I, the third question that came up, which I'm fascinated as well by the uh, public-private partnership and people who are over 50, you've actually put your finger on one of the key issues, and that is the environment in which most teachers participated, the ones that are in schools, has no tech, or had no technology in it whatsoever. And in some ways, you need a serious bypass strategy that also preserves the pride and knowledge of those teachers in the process. I think that's absolutely critical. But one of the things that we'll be asking the teachers to do is to step aside in certain areas. Because what kids, I mean, we already know this. You can have child soda. They know how to pull the trigger. They don't know whether or not they should. And that's never been that's never been made a part of them. A gun's a technology. Child soldiers know how to pull a trigger. And if guided, will pull a trigger wherever they're pointed. But they don't know why they're doing or the consequences of it. And that's where the teacher and the, and the social structure come in. And we have the exact same issue with this technology. Luckily, it's not quite as lethal. OK. Um, as we move, I just wanted to add, again, taking into account some of these observations on that, if we're going to move forward to post-2015 into something that's qualitatively different from the experience we've just had with the technology and that, um, I would suggest for your consideration that we perhaps more actively um, think about if we want something to happen with technology, then we have to design for it. We have to come up with the designs that will make those, those outcomes happen. And we don't do that very well right now. What happens is somebody will do, um, and I hope it isn't Alex, will get a new uh, <laughs> app for this that will get, ah, uh, smell recognition um, that, you know, linked to some uh, voice translation system on that. Great. What will happen then? Okay, well, let's go in now and see. We, we're darn sure that this is going to help early grade reading in um, developing countries. And off we go to try to exploit and to measure that little particular, new little feature on that. And um, we can't do that anymore. I mean, we're wasting time and money on that. We've got to ask those kinds of you know, questions on that. Again, if our population are going to be really those people that we haven't reached yet and that are still in the worst forms of poverty on that, we have to ask them, Again, what do they want? What do they need? Um, what are the best ways to do it? And can, we, and can we fashion that to assist that process? Not hope that we've got something there that eh, maybe we can customize, adapt a little bit for them. And here it is, and hope it works. So um, that would be my other questions. So other questions? Um, hi, I'm Rudaba Nasser. I work for Voice of America, which is a US federal broadcasting agency. So we talked about access is a problem, but to me, I think awareness and creating um, a change in people's attitudes and behaviors towards technology and accepting that technology is a problem too. So I would like to know from the panelists, uh, how do you address that concern in your work? You know, what are the specific ways are you using social and behavior change communication strategies just to get people to uh, use what you're making and designing there? Okay, who would like to take the first crack at that one? Okay, I, 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 I just, just left Sierra Leone. I, I said to the permanent secretary that in this one limited area of information about schooling, that very soon there'd be a tablet in every school in Sierra Leone for use by the headmasters and a few teachers. And he just started shaking his head. And two other people in the same panel said, oh, well, but then children won't be going out and playing. They won't learn the traditional skills, et cetera, et cetera. And, oh, and by the way, the teachers won't know what to do. That, that's from a real live conversation. Now, this is the part where the digital literacy is in the 9% range. Um, but yet, they all had cell phones. And in fact, they had to shut them off for the presentation because they were, they were getting so many calls. Um, this will be an evolutionary process. It can be accelerated, okay, we know that. 
certain things can happen if the right guidance is there, particularly the leadership. But the, um, there is a lot of digital awareness, but there's mainly a lot of digital ignorance because people haven't seen a path and can't relate it to what would normally happen. The example would be, as any parent knows, they will limit screen time for their children. First it was TV, now they realize it has to be iPads and whatever. Why? Because other parts of their human development are not being properly sustained and nurtured. And that's where the role of an adult or the society values really comes in. And that's what you've really got to be sensitive to. Because I have to say in many ways, the technology is the easy part. Uh, the, the people change much, much more slowly than the, the gizmos that we can create for them. And, and I don't want this to sound soft because I think it's a really hard issue. Uh, people have to address that very directly. They have to say, what is it that we want for a learned child or an educated child or even a child that becomes a good citizen? We have to know that. And we have to see to the extent we can through part, partially experimentation. We've got to try this stuff out to make sure that our theories are correct. So we have to apply it. And we, have to, we really have to make that, that commitment. And so I, I know in the case of Sierra Leone, they actually have a five-year path to get where I, I think they need to get. And part of what I've reminded them is nobody in Europe is waiting for you to catch up. We haven't got a lot of time. Okay. Quickly, uh, uh, Alex, one, and then we've got two more questions that I think we'll be able to get in before we break. Yeah, to add to the point of reinvention, um, I think what we heard at uh, the first panel today um, was this danger of reinventing the wheel. And I actually really, really like reinventing the wheel. I think that's one of the great things technology allows us to do because the horse-drawn carriage has a very different wheel than the car that we drive today. And technology, especially software systems, this is how, this is their strength that they bring to the market is that you can iterate and iterate and fix and break and learn over and over and over and adapt very quickly. So reinventing the wheel, I think, is a good thing. Duplicating mistakes and not learning from mistakes, I think, is the real danger. Go ahead. And okay. just quickly on that, I mean, I think one of the things we also need to be aware of is that um, as much as technology can be the great enabler and, and um, uh, it can also be a great disabler and it can bring people kind of apart and you can end up in your own little zone and, and you can almost lose the community. And I think to the extent in, in trying to raise awareness and, and, and bring, um, use it as a tool, you have to kind of go, again, go back to kind of old school and talk to each other and not, I, I'm guilty as, as much as anyone and sort of over-relying on technology. Mm -hmm. And I think if you can sort of show that you can, that technology can be an enhancer, um, but is not going to completely sort of displace community, particularly in these, in these communities where we're working, where it is social capital and the social fabric is so, is so important. Um, I think if we can figure out how to bridge those two and actually still talk to, you know, keep the humanity, if you will, um, within it, not to be nice. a little foo -foo, but it's a Thank thing you. we see. Good. Okay. Hi, I'm Karen Schnell. I'm with Booz Allen Hamilton. And actually, Nicole, you just kind of led into my, my question, so great segue. My question is, um, technology is great. It has amazing potential. But it's access to information. It's not access to knowledge. And how do we balance, how do we design, in, in Steve's words, how do we design programs that are going to empower uh, younger people without undermining elders and the knowledge that they bring. Okay. All right. Can I get the other questions on that? And then we will try to respond as, as best we can. Yes. My name is Irene Barikirika. I'm the executive director of Enable. And we train blind children in Kenya on basic computer skills. Um, something powerful happened last month where we allowed a group of students to take their netbooks home. And this time around, instead of the blind students being locked up in their homes all day, the entire village for some of them was coming over to see what they're doing with, their, with the laptops. They could not believe a blind child can use a laptop. So there was a shift in, um, in how a blind person is viewed in a village in Kenya. So my question to Kurt is, what can we do today to get Africa to embrace technology, especially for special needs students? Because it's non-existent and it needs great investment. We need policies that work, not just policy on paper. We need curriculums. We need a lot of uh, content that is accessible. Today, textbooks for children in Kenya are all accessible on Kindles. 
but blind students only use Braille, and if you go to a school for the blind, a class of 20 students may only have one textbook. So children with, with disabilities stand to, uh, to gain a lot from technology. So what do we need to do to get Africa to em embrace technology? Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Abira Shirafkin. I have spent 16 years of my career with USAID in South Asia and Africa. Uh, my question to the panelists are, um, in my uh, growth, I've seen technology adopted, retried in developing countries where states are looking at them as a threat or to their control. Uh, they are also in some way impacting what religion is and society in itself is, uh, leading to isolation of children away. Um, to you, when you see, uh, foresee in the next 15 or 20 years, how technologies can be adopted to the developing countries or transitioning countries without threatening their family fabric? Uh, and also, what can we do uh, to make them sustainable? Because that is something which somehow the poor countries or the countries with minimum budget are unable to sustain and they are uh, grounds of experiments, uh, sadly. So I look towards you for suggestions and help us move forward in, as we say, the technology, but can we really need it in the developing world without the negative strings attached? Would like to leave? Um, well, now you're getting to the hard stuff. Yeah. Um, l let me respond to, to the last speaker. Um, one of the extraordinary aspects to certain kinds of technology is they have allowed um, they have allowed cultures to focus on certain things that are important to them. I remember a few years ago we introduced new information systems to Saudi Arabia. How did it start? It started with verses from the Quran. And believe it or not, it started with the appropriate verses to the Quran. And that had a huge effect on the adaptation of it. Now, this is a, a special society. I mean, they, they have more money than God overall. And so that wasn't the same barrier. But, but many of the techniques that were being used then can now be applied for much less cost in different platforms. So you, this was one of the ways you had to be extremely culturally sensitive and to bring that about. We also tried to find the best curricula we could and actually put it on iPads. And these, as a matter of fact, were closed iPads. They were not accessing the internet because the society wasn't ready for that yet. So you had iPads as universal access devices to appropriate learning, at least what the society considered appropriate learning. And that did two things. It got many children a bit more excited. They could take everything home. Uh, they, they didn't have to have backpacks full of 25 pounds of books to, to start getting a slightly broader curriculum. Uh, the other thing it did was it started to introduce math and science, which was not actually a typical part of the Quranic curriculum. And so you began to move beyond mere rote and move into some other areas. Now, the, the detailed scientific research hasn't been done on that. And so I, you know, we can't say that it's been a success, but it, it, it's, it's a really major, it, it caused a major rethinking of how things could be done. And there, things move very slowly. So, on the very quickly, on the, on the issue of, of the blind, th this has been a real concern for me, actually. Um, Klipsch, who makes Klipshorn speakers, was heavily involved in extending the technologies he knew about to the blind. Um, in fact, one of the founders of AED that, that I used to work for, um, Sidney Tickton, had macular degeneration. So he was using technology to blow everything up on the screen. He could make an E, a single letter, look this big. And he could, in fact, continue to read. Um, this has now become much more possible. And here you have the amplifier effect. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm convinced that, that as, frankly, as it gets cheaper and you get some localization which see this as a priority. Because remember, there's always three parts. There's the people and the process and the technology. You've got to get those three together to help the, the disadvantaged community. Um, I'm sorry, that's a little glib, but, but that's the three things that have to happen before that can really move forward. Okay, Nicole, Alex, one last kind of quick um, response to the uh, last questions, if you would. 
I guess just a quick thought. I mean, on the on the just the whole idea of the social capital and the social fabric. Again, I go back to you know leveraging young people within their families as leaders, but also, again, like anything. I mean, thinking about the you know the, the it's not the message, it's the messenger. And so, um, how do we engage? And this is more of a, a question than an answer. Um, but how do we engage you know faith leaders and faith communities if if that's you know if the concerns are coming from um, communities of faith and and what the technology means and how do you again engage you know faith leaders and get them you know comfortable in the first instance um, and you know so we talk about in in the schools we really need to focus on teachers right because again it's just a tool so how do we make sure that we're sort of training teachers and including teachers um, so that they don't feel displaced that they feel empowered by the technology not disempowered by it um, so. I think that's kind of a starting point on that. And just thinking about the way that, you know, um, demonstration effect, where technology works in one aspect of your life and you may not even be realizing it. Um, you know, on the education side, this is just an interesting example on the, we didn't really get to talk about ed education, technology, and financing of education. Um, but, you know, there's some interesting um, things happening, leveraging remittances through sort of financial technologies to fund um, education. Um, sort of direct funding of education by, to the student from via banking technologies. Um, so again, finding different ways that um, it can really enhance your life, and I think you know messaging that more broadly. Uh, I think on the question of the sustainability, I mean, this is it should be a pretty obvious scenario, right? If a government couldn't afford to put textbooks in schools, how can they afford to replace computers? Um, a way we can mitigate that, I don't know if this solves the issue, is how we think about technology and its place in the curriculum. So instead of necessarily teaching towards, um, you know, building CVs or things like that, we can build and integrate repair and understand that repair and breakdown are key instances um, in technology and education. So if you think back to how you remember uh, you know, a physics practicum or something like that, what you probably remember most from your chemistry lesson is the time that it went the most wrong, like when someone caught their hair on fire or something like that. It's the same, that same sort of principle, it's a little bit goofy, um, happens, you, rem you remember things and you learn very well when you circumvent a problem, when you repair and when you fix something. And so let's take, to a certain degree, this problem of broken computers that need to be repaired and maintained, and let's integrate that into this youthful spirit of innovation and experimentation, and utilize that as a cycle so that the t students themselves are learning to maintain the resources and also developing um, marketable job skills um, in emergent repair economies that keep mobile phones working all over the world. Okay, before we close, I want to ask the audience again, we'll have a little interactive poll here. Um, as we look after 2015, how, what is your assessment? Is it toward the contribution of technology to um, in the development challenges ahead? And that I'm gonna break it, dichotomize it. Are you more hopeful um, that this is gonna play a major make a major contribution to solving the problems that we'll be addressing, or the second one would be somewhat less hopeful on that. <laughs> How many would see things as more hopeful? Less hopeful? Okay. It's a selected audience. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Self-selected. <laughs> but um, at, least we didn't, at least we didn't discourage some of you away from these as a result of that today. Okay. Um, Get there their will names, be no, Steve. Get what? their names, Get please. Their uh, everyone. <laughs> okay, um, you, we will be um, discharging you to uh, lunch, and I hope some of these conversations will continue there. Uh, we will not be have time for any kind of conclusions in that, but you. Come at five o'clock, and we. This is being professionally done. Uh, we see Gordon West sitting there. On that, we'll be. Okay, so thank you. Um, thank you to uh, Anna and Shearston for your help in pulling us together. Um, more work than you would believe in getting something like this to happen on that. So thank you for coming. Thank you. Thanks. This index of yours is a great idea. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Have you seen it? Yeah. I'll get no, I haven't. It. And that's what I want to do. Really? Oh, my gosh. I got a free takeaway. Free takeaway. Can I give you this? <laughs> is that somebody else's? Yeah. <laughs> is that
Oh, I'm kind of in. I'm kind of short. Oh, you're here? Gordon, hi. Well, Thank you. And I saw you in the midst of, you know, I've... See, one of the advantages, I keep forgetting.